All right, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, PowerShell Universal Dashboard. So it's a PowerShell module that I built uh, to allow you to build um, kind of web-based uh, dashboards and websites and REST APIs um, built completely on PowerShell. So uh, it kind of started out as mostly just dashboards, but it's kind of evolved from here. So I'll talk about a lot of the different functionality as we go through uh, this presentation. So uh, the easiest way to get up and running with uh, Universal Dashboard is to install the module, which is just Universal Dashboard, up on the PowerShell gallery. And then you can call start-ud uh, dashboard and specify a port. And it'll actually uh, start up a, a demo dashboard for you. And uh, you can kind of see you know, some of the controls and some of the functionality of the dashboard uh, via um, that command. So this is kind of, if you go to poshud.com, it's the same dashboard that's, that's running up there. But what I'm actually going to be showing off is I've actually built uh, this entire presentation in Universal Dashboard. So, hop over to this. Uh, we had a, a joke with my coworkers that you know the, the more cats you had in your presentation, the better the presentation was. So I actually have um, a rotating Giphy of cat uh, GIFs on this homepage um, to get my cat quota up. All right, so a little bit about me. Um, I am a six-time Microsoft MVP in Cloud and Data Center. I've been around PowerShell for a very long time. I originally wrote uh, Power GUI VSX, which was the first PowerShell integration in Visual Studio, and later wrote uh, PowerShell Tools for Visual Studio, which a lot of people use. Um, I own my own software company now, which uh, the Universal Dashboard kind of falls under the, um, the umbrella of. So I sell a couple of products uh, via that. My day job is a software architect at um, Stealth Bits Technologies. We make a lot of uh, threat detection and analytics kind of stuff. So uh, dealing with uh, detecting threats in people's environments, that kind of stuff. Um, and for fun, I'm uh, an endurance athlete. I've done um, two different Ironman triathlons, and I'm always kind of you know running a lot and biking a lot. Um, I live out in Haley, Idaho, which is kind of in the Sawtooth National Forest. Uh, I dig it out here because it's really pretty. All right, so enough about me. Let's talk a little bit about uh, our topic today, which is PowerShell Universal Dashboard. So like I said, you can create beautiful websites with PowerShell. Um, the idea is that you don't have to touch any HTML or CSS or anything like that. You can just build your, your websites with PowerShell, integrate with your PowerShell modules, and uh, build tooling around those PowerShell modules that then you can access from any web browser. Um, Universal Dashboard is built on top of uh, a couple uh, cool technologies. Um, first, it's uh, it's based on .NET Core and ASP.NET Core. Um, so ASP.NET Core or ASP.NET Core is a web server and framework for building web-based uh, technologies, and that's what hosts the website for uh, PowerShell Universal Dashboard. It takes care of a lot of the plumbing that uh, is responsible for like serving web pages, and web socket interaction, and authentication, and authorization, that kind of thing. On the client side, we are using a JavaScript library called React. React was developed by Facebook, and it allows us to create websites uh, referred to as single page applications. So if you notice when I'm clicking around in here, it's not reloading the entire page. That's because I have a single page, and as I click around, it's executing JavaScript that has been uh, transpiled using the React framework. And the React framework makes it like uh, really fast to render and that kind of thing, um, rather than writing typical JavaScript. The design concepts that are currently in um, Universal Dashboard are that of material design. So uh, material design is a set of concepts by Google. Um, and there have been some frameworks built around material design. That's uh, where you kind of see these, you know, these cards and you know the text and the way things lay out and that kind of stuff is the concept is material design. Um, currently, uh, Universal Dashboard is using a library called Materialize. Eventually, we're going to be moving to another implementation called Material UI that is going to provide a lot more functionality uh, inside Universal Dashboard. And then, obviously, uh, PowerShell is the front end for this. So the idea is that you know you don't have to write JavaScript or HTML or CSS if you don't want to. Uh, you can just use PowerShell, integrate with your existing PowerShell modules, and then build the websites and REST APIs uh, just with PowerShell. So some other tidbits of information about Universal Dashboard: you can host it anywhere. So it's, it's built on 
um, .NET Core uh, and PowerShell Core, meaning that anywhere that you could run those things, you can run a universal dashboard. So you can host it on the command line. There is a service included, so you can run it as a Windows service. You can also host it in Azure and IIS, which I'll show you how to do in a little bit. Uh, you can also spin it up in a Docker container or even put it on a Raspberry Pi. So I actually have a Raspberry Pi running Raspbian, um, and it's hooked up to some home automation stuff I was futzing around with, and it's all run with a uh, universal dashboard front end. So you can kind of like click around on that. Um, along with that, it's also cross-platform, so it runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac. Uh, some of the things that you can do, in addition to just websites, is expose things like REST APIs. So a REST API, the concept there is that you can use standard HTTP requests from kind of any system to interact with your uh, universal dashboard web service. Um, that means you can use something that's not PowerShell or integrate with some sort of other web service to kind of like communicate with your PowerShell modules. Um, and I'll show you guys how to build some uh, universal dashboard endpoints using uh, that uh, functionality. Um, all right, we're already looking at some of the controls that you can use, but there's tons of controls that are built in the universal dashboard for uh, visualizing data, getting input via text boxes and grids and um, tables and that kind of stuff. So we'll go over some of those controls. Um, there is built-in authentication. The enterprise edition of this particular module uh, provides authentication. So you can actually integrate with things like Azure, Azure AD, um, you can use OAuth for things like Microsoft, Twitter, Google, or Facebook authentication. And then you can use new role-based access via policies or roles that you can assign as people are logging in. Um, there's very advanced customization. I'll kind of dig a little bit into uh, the customization aspect of this. But you can pretty much pull in any HTML code that you want. If you wanted to like, use some sort of custom HTML, uh, you can do that, custom CSS or JavaScript. You can also build your own custom controls uh, via an API that is built into Universal Dashboard, so you can bring in all kinds of new controls. Um, finally, uh, Universal Dashboard Community Edition is free, so 99% of what I'm showing off today is actually in Universal Dashboard Community Edition, so all the controls, the REST APIs, the web server, all that stuff is free, and it's open source up on GitHub, so that's kind of where I track all the issues and all the sources up there if you guys have play with or if you want to you know, contribute anything back to the, the project, you definitely can. So that is kind of an overview of Universal Dashboard, but I kind of want to dig into actually building uh, a dashboard itself. So as I said, this entire presentation is inside a dashboard. And um, let's actually pop over to this layout page. So one of the uh, kind of primer concepts that you need to know when you're building a dashboard is how to lay out the controls on your dashboard. Uh, right now, we have a blank page. and if we pop over to the code, uh, what you're actually going to see uh, is some familiar PowerShell script, I guess. Um, up at the top here, we're importing the universal dashboard module. Um, one thing I usually do is have a get UD dashboard, stop UD dashboard, so that we stop any running dashboards. Um, and then at the very bottom of this script, I'll have um, a start UD dashboard. So one thing that I'm utilizing in this demonstration is the auto reload functionality. So anytime I make a change to this particular file, it'll automatically stop the dashboard, restart the dashboard, and update the um, the actual web browser with the new changes. So you don't have to like you know stop and start it all manually that kind of thing. So we're actually going to be looking at layouts to start out with, and um, the idea with the layout is that we want to put controls on our page in you know some format. You don't want to just like Put them on there willy nilly, and um, you want to make it look nice. So, um, the first concept here is that we are creating a new page, and that's the layout page that we're looking at. Uh, you just use new UD page and specify some content for that page, and then that's what shows up in the web browser. From there, you're using PowerShell command lines to actually define the different components inside your page. So, if I make an edit here, I'm adding a new heading uh, that's kind of describing the, the um, content below it. So I'm using new UD layout for simple layouts. So this is the first type of layout you can use. So new UD layout allows you to specify column-based layouts. You pretty much just say, like, I want this many columns um, on my dashboard. And then you put controls within the content of that layout, and it'll automatically adjust the layout based on the number of controls that are in there. So if I pop back to my dashboard, um, now you're going to see that I have uh, 
set up a, a simple layout, a three column layout with uh, these nine controls in it. If I were to change that layout to something, you know, for example, like a, a four column layout, it'll actually oops, adjust the layout now into a four column layout and automatically lay out those controls um, based on that configuration. So that's like the easiest way to lay out controls. Um, if you want a little more control, uh, there's new UD row and new UD column, which allows you to uh, kind of specify the sizing of the rows and columns and which components go in each one of those, that kind of thing. So as you can see here, I have a new UD row um, with a column block after it. And inside there, I have three different columns specified. And each one of these columns is uh, uh, its own size. So this first column is a size of four, two, and six. So the grid system in Universal Dashboard is a 12-column grid system. So you just need to divide that up um, however you want um, in order to uh, lay out your controls. So the first column is one-third of the page, and then one-sixth of the page, and then uh, half the page. So if we go back to our layout, you'll see that's how the columns have now laid out on our Universal Dashboard uh, page. So this is third, sixth, and then half. In addition to being able to uh, just kind of change the sizes, you can also specify offsets. So this first column here is specifying an offset of the page of size two. So now if I go back, there's a little gap here on the left-hand side that um, I've offset that particular column by two. All right. Um, and finally, uh, you can actually set up your dashboard to be like mobile responsive. Since we are a web application, we want this to work on small, medium, and large screens. Uh, you can actually specify a small size, a medium size, and a large size for all your columns. And they'll actually change based on the screen size. So if I go back here, um, I'm on a large screen, so now I want it to take up you know, a very small portion of the screen. But if I actually um, change the size of this window, if I shrink it down a little bit, all of a sudden you'll see it, it'll snap, and now the, this particular control is taking up more of the screen. Uh, as I make the width even smaller, eventually, once it gets uh, to a certain level, it'll actually take up the whole screen. So you can think of that as a phone or something like that. And then all these columns will automatically um, you know, fold over to the next row and everything if you kind of set it up correctly with the sizes. So that's kind of how you lay out controls in Universal Dashboard. But um, what kind of controls are available to you? So I'm going to go over some of the like, basic controls that you can use um, to put on your dashboards. So the first one is cards. So we've already been looking at cards. Cards are just kind of like basic containers in material design. The idea is that you know you have a title, you have some content, you put links at the bottom, that kind of thing. Um, so if we go over to our dashboard and go to the basics page, you'll see a couple examples of some cards. I can customize you know, the content. You can actually put other controls inside cards and nest them in there, that kind of thing. Um, you can also customize colors, um, foreground and background colors, or provide actions is what they call them, or links at the bottom of the cards to open up you know, new things, that kind of thing. So that's a very, probably the most basic control that you'll find inside Universal Dashboard. Uh, additionally, there's things like collections. So it's more or less just a list of things. Uh, collection is just, you know, Step one, two, three in this example is just a collection. Uh, you get a little more interactive with things like uh, collapsibles. So collapsible allows you to um, create you know, sections that uh, you can click on, and it will open and close uh, and hide the content um, based on uh, how you configure it. So in this example, we're using pop-out collections or uh, collapsibles with some icons to you know, signify what might be in there, that kind of thing. And then again, you can next whatever controls you want inside this dashboard. So again, realize that you know I can put any kind of PowerShell script in here, and then output the uh, the actual result of those PowerShell you know, invocations into these uh, controls content. Um, I'm going to go a little bit more into this later, but there are also input controls. So this is where I kind of mentioned that Universal Dashboard kind of evolved from a dashboard into more of like a, a full-featured web UI kind of thing. So much like you know you could build a web or a UI in Windows Forms or WPF, you can also build like forms that take input inside Universal Dashboard. 
So you have you know buttons and checkboxes and switches and you know selects that kind of thing and text boxes where you can type in text. So those are kind of some of the examples of the basics. Um, there's a lot of other basic controls that you can kind of play with that uh, come along with the JavaScript or JavaScript and CSS library we're using called Materialize. Um, and we brought in a whole bunch of controls that you can use to kind of integrate your PowerShell scripts in and you know build a website with. Some of the more like visually appealing controls are um, controls that we kind of display content, uh, you know, in like a data vis visualization. So charts and counters and tables and grids, which um, I will get into right now. So this first control that I'll be talking about is a counter. So the idea with a counter is that it literally just shows a count on the screen. Um, you can do things like customize the size of the text and the icon that's kind of like the watermark in the background, that kind of thing. Um, in this example, what I'm doing is I'm actually using um, a module called the Strava module. So Strava is a, uh, an activity tracking module, kind of like Map My Ride or um, any one of those like Fitbit kind of things. But um, that's what I use to track like all my training, that kind of thing. Uh, so I built a PowerShell module that more or less calls a REST API. Um, and in this example, what I'm doing is I am calling that Strava activity. Um, I'm specifying an access token that I have available. Um, and then I'm getting the you know, last 100 pages of results um, in the last month. So you can see I have a before and an after date uh, where I specify pretty much this month's number of activities. So now if I go to my dashboard, and I go to visualizations. Uh, you can see I did 16 activities this month. So I, you know, running or biking and that kind of thing. Um, it has a little bike watermark on the background, um, that kind of thing. So that actually went out to Strava. It got that information and it executed that PowerShell script in the background. So one thing to note here is I am actually using an endpoint versus content. So power, or Universal Dashboard is kind of two ways to load data into uh, the dashboard itself. Content is more of like a static, uh, a static uh, construct where uh, it runs when you actually execute the PowerShell script. An endpoint, on the other hand, is executed every time the page is loaded. So if you notice, if you kind of pay attention quickly enough, if I reload this page, you'll see it was zero at first and then it jumped to 16. That's because it actually went back and called back to the web server and um, uh, updated that value. Uh, so there's lots of controls that have both content and endpoint, and just know that like uh, endpoint loads dynamically every time you load the page. Meaning you could, you know, I might go out and do another activity, and then rather than having to restart my dashboard, I actually just you know refresh the page, or I have an auto refresh set that will actually update that value. Uh, rather than having to restart the dashboard. Um, in addition to uh, things like counters, you can also help with things like tables. So in this example, I have a new UD table, and I'm sure the last 10 activities that I have done in Strava. Uh, it's calling the same get Strava activity um, commandlet to get you know last 10 items. And then it's going to pretty much format those items in this for each, and then output that data via out UD table data. So again, I'm inside an out and endpoint. So anytime I load the page, it's actually going to go out, and it's going to run this uh, this PowerShell script right here uh, inside the server. So uh, I'm getting my activities, and then I'm formatting them. And the first thing you'll see is you know I'm mapping type to type. I'm taking the date and I'm actually converting it into a date time because I want to say this is in like, uh, I don't know, some format, but I'm trying to format it better using a date time. I think I'm converting this to miles from meters or something like that. Uh, and then I'm turning the, you know, the, the actual time I spent doing this activity from the number of seconds into an actual like, more readable time. Finally, the thing that you can do is you can actually nest other controls inside the table. So I want to create a link that actually goes out to that activity. Now if we go back to our dashboard, you can see it's now created this table. Here are the activities I've done, the last 10 activities I've done, um, the amount of time I spent doing them, and then 
Uh, on the very right hand side here, you can see that I have a link that I can click on. It'll actually jump me back out to Strava, and you can actually see that, that activity that I did. So that's kind of an example of integrating with you know, some other system to bring in data, to format it, and make it look nice in this dashboard in kind of a single pane of glass, all using PowerShell. All right, to get even a little more fancy and a little more visual, you can actually also create charts. So currently, uh, there are two chart libraries uh, used by Universal Dashboard. Uh, the first is Chart.js, which I'll show off right now. So new unique chart is how you access Chart.js charts. Um, by default, I think it is a bar chart. So you can see I'm not specifying any type of chart here. Um, and I want to get the hours spent this month doing this activity. Uh, again, I'm calling the same stuff, the same uh, Strava API um, to get the activities for the last month. And then what I'm doing is I'm grouping them so that I can display them in the chart. So there's a little bit of data wrangling that you have to do here. Um, so I'm taking the activities. I'm grouping them by type with group object. Um, and then I'm iterating over each group of um, each group of objects. I'm listing that type of activity. And then I'm uh, pretty much accumulating those values into a sum of the total hours spent doing those activities. So you can see here that I get the moving time from that group. I sum them together using measure object, and then convert it into a time span, and eventually turn it into hours so it's a little more readable than just seconds. Um, and then in the chart, you have to specify the data and the label property. So in this case, we want the label property to be the type. So the type of activity, or are we running, or are we biking, that kind of thing. And then the data, you know, the size of your bar on the Y axis will be the time. And I've customized some colors so that uh, it actually looks kind of nice uh, in Universal Dashboard. So now I'm going to go back here. Uh, you'll see that I spent a lot of time biking and you know, just a little time running sort of thing. Um, one thing to note here is that you can actually customize the axis uh, uh, for this. And the only reason that this looks kind of weird is because we don't have a zero axis. Um, I wish I would have done that, and it would have looked a little bit better. But um, that's why this particular thing on the left looks so small. Um, but yeah, so there's the ride and the run on the left. If you hover over, it gives you the values that you actually um, provided via PowerShell. Um, let's just do another chart. Uh, in this case, we're actually going to do a very, very similar thing. Uh, the only difference here is we're actually grouping by distance, so the distance traveled per month. Um, and I want to say I'm doing a different type of chart, so I'm going to try a pie chart. So all I have to do is specify the type of pie, and it'll switch it over to a pie chart. I've grouped the data very similarly. Uh, I just grabbed a different uh, metric. So now when I come back to my dashboard, you can see I have distance traveled per month. Um, and it's a pie chart where I can hover over and see how many miles I, I've done this month for each one of those activities. Um, finally, this one, actually, I wish I would have hooked up to my Strava activity, but I wanted to show an example of some of the other charts. So there's another chart library we bring in called um, Nevo Charts. Uh, and Nevo offers a bunch of crazy charts that uh, ChartGX doesn't provide. Um, in this case, oh. I think I might have broke it. This guy again. Um, so Nevo charts uh, provide a little more functionality. In this case, I'm actually using a calendar chart. So all the stuff that I kind of skipped by up here is uh, generating some random data for the calendar chart. So it's kind of like different types of food or different types of countries. Um, Oh, actually, these are two different charts. I see what I did wrong. So yeah, this is a heat map chart that I generated up here. Um, so per country type of food, and then I'm generating random values. Um, and then the other chart that I'm using via the Nevo charts is a calendar chart, which is similar to like the GitHub like um, contribution chart that you usually see when you like the user's GitHub page. Hopefully, I didn't break everything too much. There we go. So these are the types of charts that the Nevo uh, library can build. Um, so the left hand side here, here's our heat map. You can see the change, the colors change automatically based on you know, the heat of that um, particular item. And they can uh, kind of hover over and see the actual values. And then on the right hand side here, this is an example of a calendar chart where it's like the number of activities or whatever you want per day. I'm just using get random to output some 
value that we put. And then based on like how hot that particular day was in comparison to its counterparts, then the color will change based on that automatically. So Nevo is kind of cool because it offers like color palettes and all that kind of stuff. So there's a little more functionality inside of the Nevo charts. All right. Um, I think I'm going to just pause for questions quick. If there's any questions that anyone wants to answer before I keep going or ask before I keep going. If not, I will just continue on. All right. All right. So one thing I want to highlight with uh, Universal Dashboard is it's not just about dashboards. I, uh, I wish I uh, would change the name to something else. I haven't thought of a cool one yet. But uh, the other thing that I could do is actually take input from users. So a lot of people that I see actually building dashboards, they're not building you know, reporting tools. There's other reporting tools out there. People even said when I first released this, like, why won't you just use Grafana or, you know, like, why don't you use Power BI, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I was like, ah, because I wanted to use PowerShell, and it's cool that I built this, you know, that kind of thing. But then I started uh, adding some more dynamic functionality into it. And one of those things is inputs. So not only can you actually show data, you can actually take data from your users. So one example of an input is the new UD input control. So the new UD input control kind of behaves in a couple different ways. And I could say the most basic way is that you can specify a new UD input with a title, uh, an endpoint block, and then if you put a param at the top, it'll automatically generate an input um, page for you that uh, exposes these types of fields. So the first one would be a string field, like you know, a, a Boolean switch field, or a day of the week like drop down field. And then inside that endpoint, after uh, the user enters that information, you can actually execute PowerShell script. So in this case, I'm going to show a toast, which is just a little like message box that pops up inside the dashboard. But you know, you could go off and invoke something in your ServiceNow API or down in Config Manager or whatever. You know, um, just integrate with whatever PowerShell thing you want. So let's go input page. So this is the type of input that was just generated. So I didn't have to like specify what kind of fields I wanted. It kind of like uh, interpolated that from the types of data that I should be expecting. Um, so since I didn't specify any value for text, I could just say, hello. Um, and then this was a switch parameter that I can specify as a checkbox. And then uh, this bottom one is a select. Uh, day of the week is an enumeration. And uh, because it's an enumeration, Universal Dashboard will go out and say, like, what are the values of this enumeration? And that's what these are. So I can specify Wednesday. Now if I click this, you'll see this little thing in the top right corner here is a a uh, little toast message. So those are the values that I typed in or selected or whatever. Um, so you could go out and do whatever PowerShell you want. But in this case, it just kind of showed a message to the user. So we can take that like a step further if we want, um, and actually take other action after we, um, you know, we do these things. So there's a new UD input action commandlet that allows you to do things like show those toasts. Um, redirect to other uh, pages or replace the input like you know page with a different control sort of thing. So if you wanted to like take input and then show a chart or like take input and like show confirmation, something like that, uh, that's what you could use this for. In this example, now we have uh, where should we go? I don't know to the moon. And if I submit that, uh, it goes to a different page where it lists out that we went to to the moon. Right. Uh, one thing that was added kind of recently was the ability to actually validate inputs. Uh, just like any PowerShell function, you can now put validate um, arguments or parameters, I guess, at argument attributes on parameters. Um, in this case, I'm validating the length of this text field. So you can't actually input this data until you uh, type between one or 10 characters of text. So you can put any kind of validation in here you want, like script block validation or um, you know validate set validation, that kind of thing. So now what happens is if we go over here and I type one character or if I type too many characters, it's going to go out and validate. And you can just um, hover over this and it gives you some information about why I can't input this. And as you can see, the, the submit is no longer enabled. So you guys can validate whatever input you want based on 
um, based on that. Uh, and then finally, I just want to talk about uh, customizing inputs. So uh, if you want a little more control and you don't want to just use this kind of parameter style input, you can actually specify your inputs using new UD input field. Um, and that has a, a little more like fine grain control. And one example of that fine grain control is like, I could specify a file input. So a file input allows you to kind of like accept text files and then do some processing on them. So in this example, I want to get a CSV um, for my input. And then I'm going to get it via this uh, CSV variable. These, these two things need to match. And then from there, I can actually convert that CSV into some objects using convert from CSV. And then I want to pop up modal, which is just kind of like a you know, message box over the top, uh, with a grid of that data. So let's try that once and see if it works. So I have this custom inputs. I have my CSV button. And it opens up this. And let's go to my presentations folder. I can open this CSV. And if I submit that, it's actually going to process that CSV via PowerShell. And then it actually generated this grid that I could show to my user. Or I can take that CSV and you know whatever, process it, insert stuff into whatever. Um, but in this example, I'm just kind of processing stuff and showing it back to the user. So that's what was in the uh, CSV. All right, so I think that's as deep as I wanted to go in inputs, uh, but kind of taking it a step further in terms of like um, being able to interact with the dashboard, I want to talk a little bit about dynamic interfaces. So if anyone's worked with uh, Windows Forms in PowerShell or even uh, WPF in PowerShell, uh, there's kind of the uh, concept of like event handling. Uh, where you might have a button, and then you want to specify an on-click handler where you click the button, and it does something. Um, in this case, uh, you can actually do that with Universal Dashboard. So it's actually taking advantage of a technology called WebSockets. So WebSockets, uh, it pretty much connects the client to the server in a continuous stream of data. Typically, HTTP is kind of like, you know, you re request response, request response. Um, and in this case, uh, this is more like an open channel between the two, and you can kind of communicate at will, and you can fi fire messages back and forth. Uh, it's using a technology built on top of WebSockets called SignalR, which is part of ASP.NET. So uh, in this first example, what I'm doing is I have, actually, I think I'm just going to do this whole thing. Yeah. Oh, no. I broke it again. So in this first example, I have a new UD element. This is kind of where I was talking to you, like you could create any HTML tag you want. You can do that with new UD element. Um, and I'm specifying uh, a tag that is a div, an HTML div tag, and give me an ID of placeholder. Uh, then I'm creating a button. The button is going to say, uh, click me. And then I have an on-click handler where I want to update that placeholder element with this content. So it's actually going to it's going to update this guy and set this this text into that div. So if I go back here and go to oops, dynamic interfaces and I click click me, you can see I clicked that. What happened is it communicated up over a web socket to the server, it executed some powershell script and then it updated this this particular uh, element with that content. So there's like a lot of possibility there. So it's getting kind of complicated, but uh, I mean, you can pretty much specify. Oh, geez, I only read it notifications. Um, uh, you can specify any content here. You can put other controls in there, not just text. You can do whatever you want. Um, some other things uh, that you can do uh, include like toasting, which I showed before, uh, modals, like a loading dialogue, that kind of thing. So. All these things are kind of integrated, interacting with that, that WebSocket layer to interact with PowerShell script in the background um, dynamically. Um, not only can you like, set the content of things or like you know execute scripts, but you can kind of modify the actual content that's in here. So every time I click this, it's adding a new daytime control. So you can do the same thing. You can add any control over and over to a parent control. And then if you don't want to see those anymore, you can clear those. 
So if you look at my PowerShell script, what I'm calling is add UD element, which is adding elements to this a list of dates, um, unordered list. And then it's just creating a new uh, li tag inside that, that particular element over and over again. And then you can use clear UD elements to clear all the children out of there so it no longer has those. All right, and then finally, one thing I would like to show, it's kind of a, it's a funny little hack. So there's a, a hidden uh, column endpoint that you don't actually see, and it's running forever. And what it's going to do is it's going to actually update this digital uh, element here, and uh, I'll put the time. And it's going to sleep for one second. So what you end up having is a clock. So what's happening here is in the background, there's actually a PowerShell script running um, continuously. And every second, it's sending a message down to the web browser to say, this is the current time, this is the current time, this is the current time. And you end up with a clock. All right. So now, let's see. To take it even a step further with the custom elements. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of the dynamic stuff. Um, that can get kind of crazy. It's kind of uh, hard to manage. We're kind of thinking of ways to like make this a little bit better. Like you know, all these examples seem really easy and straightforward until you have like a whole bunch of this stuff going on. It's going all over the place. Um, so I think it works well for simple scenarios. We're trying to kind of smooth out some of the more complex ones. All right. So custom elements I want to talk a little bit about because one thing I like uh, immediately realized with Universal Dashboard is once people realize that they can. Um, you know, they have some access to like these, you know, X number of controls. They always wanted more controls. So I started uh, implementing the ability to like create custom controls. Um, and the easiest way to create custom controls is something like, like new UD element. I kind of showed this already where you can specify any tag and it will create an HTML tag inside Universal Dashboard. So this creates just a div inside uh, UD. So um, there is a div. It's custom because it has like custom styles set on it. Like you have to actually know the CSS styles that exist inside HTML or you know the CSS and HTML uh, ecosystem to you know make this work the way you want. But you do have that ability. So padding, background color, and color are all different uh, CSS style tags that I'm applying to this element, and that's how I uh, achieve that custom uh, look and feel. Uh, because of this, you can also like you know get real crazy and do things like SVG tags. So an SVG tag is a vector graphic that you can uh, define in HTML using HTML vector tags. So I want to create an SVG tag that has, is a rectangle. You can specify the sizes of that rectangle. Um, this is like the rounding of the rectangle. Um, some colors. And then when I come back to my uh, dashboard, you'll see that I've drawn this little rectangle all with HTML tags. And it's kind of, if you think about it, it's kind of creating this HTML in the background, more or less. All right, so those are kind of like the custom elements you can kind of build using HTML. But um, taking it a step further, what you can actually do, I did a stream of this last week of how to create custom controls using like JavaScript in PowerShell. So, so everything is um, React-based. If you, there's a React library you want to build, uh, I actually have a custom template that you can use to bring in that React library and just add any control to Universal Dashboard. Um, and if you actually, I don't know if I have this open. Yeah, I do. Um, in here, I actually have this thing called Universal Dashboard knob, and um, now there's a React knob control that I wanted to bring in. So I have like you know a bunch of JavaScript that's been compiled, and I've created this new UD knob function, that kind of thing. It has all these different properties that I can give it. But um, if you look at the very bottom of my script, what I'm actually doing is I'm importing that module. So I'm importing this Universal Dashboard knob module, and it actually registers all that JavaScript and um, PowerShell with Universal Dashboard, and that allows me to um, use that control uh, right in Universal Dashboard. So now I'm calling new UD knob, and what this is actually doing is getting the current date, and then it has three different knobs of different colors, and then setting the three different values, um, so hour, minute, and second. So then what I end up with is I have these knobs that have the time. So um, 
And it's set on a refresh interval of one second, so every second it's going back and reloading these controls. Um, so this was a custom control that's not actually part of Universal Dashboard that I built, you know, kind of based on this template that I have out there, and then you can bring it in to Universal Dashboard. So it's like super extensible. If there's controls out there that you want to see, you know, you can build them yourself or um, employ your favorite web dev to uh, kind of go out and build something like this for you. All right, so um, I want to talk a little bit about REST APIs now because uh, it's another kind of thing that evolved from Universal Dashboard that's not like totally dash. This is not dashboard at all. Like, this isn't even like a website. This is um, I want to expose PowerShell over um, you know uh, HTTP rather than uh, being able having to invoke it through PowerShell itself. So what we can use is the new UD endpoint um, commandlet. And what this does is actually registers endpoints with Universal Dashboard and says, like, I want to serve these URLs and call PowerShell script when people invoke those URLs. So uh, my URL, this one, is activity. And it's kind of like, you know, it, it's kind of a bad example because it's just like going out and calling the Strava activity API. Like I could call their REST API instead of just calling my REST API. But this is more or less forwarding from, uh, you know, my REST API call out to their REST API call and then uh, returning that data via that and then converting to JSON and sending it back to the user. So an example of using that is actually, you know, people have probably played with invoke web requests before. So this is a way to expose an API that you can use with invoke web requests. And in this case, I'm calling uh, my local host 999 is the port I'm listing on API slash athlete. And that was the, uh, you know, the other endpoint I've exposed here is the athlete API. So now if I execute that, you know, works, um, oops. you'll see that I got data back from my PowerShell Universal Dashboard uh, uh, method invoke here, the REST method invoke. Um, so yeah, so there's my, my information back from Strava. I just kind of chained it through. But you could you know put any PowerShell script in here that you wanted and invoke things uh, that way. Uh, this supports both get, post, put, and delete methods. So if you want to actually send data up to your API, it can also do that. Um, and um, yeah, so that's an example of REST APIs. All right. Hey, Adam, we had, real quick, we had a question. On the yeah, sure. Account. So one person was asking, uh, and I'm going to maybe paraphrase a little bit. Well, or interpret a little bit. Um, is can you create like a UD card, and mm -hmm. is there some easy mechanism, kind of like you would use out grid view, to display like a like a table? Uh, yeah, so you could use out UD grid to do that. Um, that kind of thing. So uh, right now you have to specify the like headers and properties. I actually had an example of that. Um, so this this right here is actually um, how you would expose a grid. Uh, you specify the headers and properties of the object that you want um, to show in the grid, and then when you say out UD grid data, it actually serializes those objects and then puts them in the grid. Um, then you can page through them and sort them and search them, that kind of thing, similar to like out grid view. That makes sense. Hope that answers the question. Find out soon enough. Okay, uh, and the one thing I've heard that people want is the ability to like export data from that. Um, there's like no way to currently do that where you export data back from the grid. Like you might want to filter in the grid or sort in the grid and then export that data back via like a download link. That's currently not implemented, but we're looking at actually replacing the grid we have now with a more fully functional one. Um, that Can you interact at all with the grid? What's that? Can you interact at all with the grid? Uh, yeah, uh, currently what's sort uh, available right now is the ability to page, uh, sort, and search the grid. Um, it also supports server side, so um, you could actually integrate with like a, you know, um, 
like a SQL server or something like that and actually do the paging, searching and sorting inside SQL server. Um, so it's actually faster. Um, so that's that's actually available in New UD Grid right now. Thanks. Yep. All right, so we kind of talked about REST APIs. Um, one thing that I also like to touch on because it's like a very big performance increase and people don't really um, don't really have or you, know, you don't really run into this unless you really need it um, is the ability to use cache endpoints. So uh, what a cache or a cache endpoint, a uh, schedule endpoint, um, and take advantage of the cache. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually setting up a scheduled endpoint. You can think of this as like a scheduled task or something that runs on an interval, um, executes some PowerShell script, and does you know something. Um, in this example, I am saying I want to run this scheduled endpoint every 10 minutes, uh, and then you use the new UD endpoint command, pass in the schedule, and then specify the endpoint that you actually want to run. And what this is going to do is go out and call that get Strava athlete uh, API in Strava and then store it in a cache variable. So there's two special scopes inside Universal Dashboard that you don't have in regular PowerShell, and that's the session and cache scope. The cache scope is available in any endpoint that you call on your entire dashboard. So what you can do here is rather than actually calling get Strava athlete, you know, every time the page loads or something like that, uh, you could collect that data in the background so that when a user comes to your website, they're looking at cache data, it's a lot faster. And um, you know, one of the examples here is that I don't want to get rate limited by Strava. So every time I go to Strava API, eventually I'm going to get rate limited if a lot of people hit my dashboard. Um, but if I have this uh, schedule set up, instead I'm storing a cache of that data, and I'll only ever load this data every 10 minutes rather than loading it every time someone loads my page. So I add this uh, cached endpoint, and I've also added a, uh, a cache um, REST API call. So if I go back here and I include um, cache value on the end of here, it's actually going to call the, the cache method. And I don't know why that didn't work. Uh-oh. My demo's broke. Um, but usually what that would do is that would return a lot quicker than um, calling a Strava API because it's just returning it from memory. Weird. I'll have to look at that. Um, yeah, so it would load that into this cache variable then it's available in all your endpoints. Um, one other thing, let's see, that we can talk about is uh, finally is the login and authorization pages. So. Um, these are only available in the Enterprise Edition, but I just want to kind of touch quickly on what you can do with login and authorization via um, Universal Dashboard. So like I said before, you can integrate with, um, I guess there's a couple other things I want to show. Uh, I'm going to show this, and then I'm going to show IAS integration so you guys can see how that works, because everybody asks about that. Um, so login pages themselves, this works in a couple different ways. Uh, there's forms authentication, which is what I'm doing here. Um, there's also OAuth and uh, Azure and uh, or Azure AD and then AD integration via IIS. Um, in this case, I'm doing forms auth. And the idea is that uh, you create a new login page, you pass in an authentication method, and then you have an endpoint that accepts a credential. So this is just a PS credential. And um, uh, what you can do inside this endpoint is uh, determine, you know, with whatever mechanism you want, uh, if this credential has the correct, um, you know, uh, authorization to access this uh, this dashboard. So in, in my example here, any user that logs in is going to be successful. Um, I could check passwords. I could, you know, integrate into some other system, that kind of thing. Uh, and if that user is successfully logged in, then they get uh, allowed access to the dashboard. Um, the other thing that I'm setting up here is an authorization policy. So this is kind of where you get into your like uh, R, you know, our back controls or role-based access control, uh, where you can actually define pages that only certain users can access. So with a um, 
uh, authorization policy, you kind of give it a name, and then you can give it an endpoint that gets executed when you try to view one of these pages that uh, you know is using this authorization policy. So then you get a claims principle, which is like an ASP.NET core uh, object that contains information about the user that's logging in, such as like if you're logging in via IES, it'll include like their uh, their groups um, and that kind of thing. Um, in this case, I'm checking to see the user's username. So if this user's username is administrator, they have uh, this authorization policy is you know true, and they'll be able to access those resources based on that authorization policy. And the way that you use that is when you set up a new page, uh, you just specify the authorization policies that are required to access this page. So I have like a, a settings page, right? It doesn't really have anything on it, but um, only the administrator user can access that page. So then I need to pass in my login page to uh, Universal Dashboard. And if I go back to here, it reloaded. There we go. Now we have a login page that you can log into. So any user can log in here. If I log in as Adam, I get logged in. I'm on the custom elements page. I don't have that settings page because I don't fit that authorization policy. But if I sign out and then I come back in as administrator, whoop, and log in, you'll see that now I have a settings page. Because I'm the administrator, I can see the settings page, that kind of thing. So that way you can kind of like lock down certain pages and build dashboards that actually have um, authorization and authentication built into them. Um, I did, oh, there's, there are a couple other things that I want to show off and hopefully I have. So first of all is running an IIS, because lots of people ask me how to do this. Um, in the Universal Dashboard module, uh, you can actually plop that into a folder um, in your WW root folder. So you can see here I'm using inetpub, WW root, nested. Um, and then I have the entire Universal Dashboard uh, content here. Universal Dashboard comes with a pre-configured web config that you can use. So this is all set up to use this Universal Dashboard server.exe um, and host using the ASP.NET core module and uh, actually serve the dashboard um, through IIS. So it's actually hosted in IIS. Um, and that's really all you have to do. And then you have to specify a dashboard.ps1 file, because that's the dashboard file that it looks for when it actually goes to load up um, IIS. So now, if we were to actually go back to IIS and then click this Browse button, um, what you'll see is that it pops open uh, my dashboard list listing on um, 80, and it's in that nested folder. So that is a dashboard running in IIS. Um, there's also, I have documentation on how to set up authentication for that and everything um, via IIS. So it's kind of similar. It uses the same mechanism when it's up in Azure, too. Um, you just deploy an Azure web app, and it's actually hosted up in IIS in Azure. Uh, one other thing I wanted to touch on uh, is you can also run this in Linux. I just wanted to prove that to everyone. So I actually made a dashboard um, using, here's VS Code on Ubuntu. Uh, I just have a little dashboard that shows off all the processes that are running on my Ubuntu Linux machine. Um, and yeah, so here's all the processes. This PowerShell script would actually probably work in uh, Windows too. There's nothing stopping. It's just using get process to list the processes. But you can see in this case, it's um, definitely running on Linux uh, using the same module that you would run on PowerShell. And um, one article that uh, I wanted to bring up was uh, Nate actually wrote this article about um, hosting uh, Universal Dashboard uh, with Nginx uh, with HTTPS. So if you are using Linux and you want HTTPS, you want like a full-fledged, you know, you know, more production standard um, way of running Universal Dashboard, there is this article about out there how to run it on Linux. Um, using this method uh, rather than just you know starting in VS code like I'm doing here in Ubuntu. So definitely go out and check that out if you're curious about running that um, out there. All right, so um, I think that kind of rounds out what I wanted to get through. Um, I did want to show you, 
you know, I made it this custom navigation stuff. So if you want to customize the navigation, it's usually automatic. You can do this. But I've added this custom navigation to my dashboard now. Actually, I'm going to get rid of this login page for this all loaded successfully. Uh, now I have some more information about a universal dashboard, such as documentation, the GitHub repo, the forums, and the marketplace. Um, if you're curious about finding out more about universal dashboard, there's a couple places that you should definitely go. Um, documentation is extensive but not complete, so uh, definitely go out to docs.universaldashboard.io to check that out. Um, always trying to uh, improve this, but uh, I know people are always looking for more information. So it's extensive, but it's not everything. Um, another great place to go is are the forums. So they're actually pretty active. So those are at uh, forums at universaldashboard.io. So if you ever have questions, definitely recommend you go out there. Uh, there's lots of super smart people that play a lot, play around with Universal Dashboard a lot. So um, you get your question answered there. Um, there is the Universal Dashboard Marketplace, which is out on ironmansoftware.com. Uh, this has a bunch of example dashboards if you want to like get started with something, like you saw something cool, you want to go play with something. Um, there are dashboards for Active Directory, Postgres. There's one that kind of just integrates with your PowerShell environment. Um, there's a Blue Hive at AD Honey User Management, so it actually in it creates users in Active Directory and that kind of thing. So if you're curious about that, there's also those custom controls that I showed off, like a uh, universal dashboard knob. Uh, and finally, uh, there's the GitHub repo. Uh, this is where you should go file issues if you have bugs, that kind of thing, or if you are uh, so inclined to uh, create new controls or fix bugs in existing controls, that kind of thing. Um, always looking for help there. Uh, yeah, I think aside from that, I am open to um, any questions that you guys may have about Universal Dashboard or building dashboards or anything. So, um, yeah, and you have it. How efficient is this? Like, if the user sees this, I was going to ask the same thing. You mentioned like it uses web sockets, right? Is that is there a limitation, or does that limit like how many people can be on there at the same time? Or? Uh, there is no like hard limit to any of this stuff, but um, obviously it's running PowerShell in the background, so you got to remember that. Like PowerShell Core is a lot faster than uh, Windows PowerShell is, but it's still not compiled code. Um, some things you could do to get, you know, you stand, you can stand up uh, caching proxies in front of this, that kind of thing. Um, the other thing that's a little more efficient is that it is using React, so. Every time I load a page, it's not going back to PowerShell necessarily. A lot of this stuff is static, and it's only getting small bits of uh, data to load those controls. So um, I'd say overall, you're not going to get the same performance out of this as you are, uh, you know, an ASP.NET Core C# -sharp web app. But um, I'd say you get pretty good performance out of it, and it's good for you know building tools in your environment, but maybe not you know building uh, the next Reddit or something. And, and you also mentioned like other products like Power BI, Grafana. Like, are there any um, I guess features that your Universal Dashboard has that where you think uh, other uh, other others are lacking? Or uh, I think both of those tools are like you know built around the data visual, visualization kind of stuff. Um, and that's kind of where Universal Dashboard started, but it's kind of expanded more into building interactive web apps and utilities. So you can definitely do a lot of that, uh, you know, basic charting and uh, you know showing data and grids and that kind of thing. But I think uh, where Universal Dashboard shines more is building more custom websites rather than just dashboards themselves for looking at data. Um, being able to you know create users in AD or you know. Uh, interact with your SQL server and insert rows and all that kind of stuff, um, that's where I think you're going to get more benefit out of this. Uh, if you're doing some hardcore BI stuff, I think you're going to find that this might be difficult to use um, uh, in terms of like building out something like you would in Power BI. Uh, we hope to kind of get there a little bit more, but like it's not there right now, I'd say. So. And they're looking it looked like there's a lot of people on the forums, but I don't know if you could glean on like what a lot of people are using it for. 
Oh, yeah. One great thing that you can look at on the forums is actually there's a show off category. So if you're ever curious about what people are actually building this for, um, there's a whole bunch of people that have built out uh, cool stuff. So some of the more popular ones that I've seen are uh, this guy has built you know a help desk system more or less for password resets and that kind of thing. This is an example of something like you know it's not really a uh, necessarily a dashboard. It's more of a utility for his help desk system. He did a really good job of making it look really good. Um, yeah, or uh, Lee's Honeypot um, utility. It actually goes out and it manages Active Directory accounts that are fake, and then kind of, um, you know, you can check to see if those accounts have been accessed, that kind of thing. So, yep. But yeah, that's a good place to look for examples of what people are actually doing. Well, thanks, Adam. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys.